I'm going to use a stand this morning. I promise I actually did study for this message. It's just that I'm going to go through a lot of scriptures, and so that way I can glance at them pretty quick. Um, over the years, uh, I've learned a lot about myself through my wife and, and through others that are close to me. Uh, those who love you will be honest with you. And one of the things that I've been told is that um, it's pretty easy to tell what kind of a mood I'm in. I'm not very good at hiding my emotions. Uh, some of you are. Some of you are like my brother Chris, who he's just stoic. You can't tell what he's feeling. That's sarcasm for anybody who knows him. Uh, but anyways, uh, and sometimes that's a good thing. Um, I, I, I live out of my emotion. I just, I do. And so the things that I do, I'm, I'm passionate. And if I'm not passionate, you know it. <laughs> I'm just, I'm not a good faker in that area. And, and that has its pros and its cons. And um, as I was uh, watching both my son and my daughter play uh, basketball this week, I was just reminded of, of some of the lessons the Lord has taught me. Uh, as I watch them play, they have similar characteristics uh, as I do in that. Um, my daughter was told the best game she ever played was after she got hit in the face with a basketball. It just fired her up and she was ready to go. And so in that way, sometimes it's good. But when things aren't going your way, it can be not so good. And I, I was reminded of when I was a younger man just coming up into high school, we had a, a varsity basketball coach that was just full of fire and passion. For those of you a little older, his hero was Bobby Knight. And he just wanted to emulate Bobby Knight. He just, but he didn't last very long. His doctor told him his heart wouldn't handle it. And before long, he was out. And actually, he had to quit uh, before I made it up to the varsity level, and so another coach came in. Well, this coach was very different, and he did not coach out of emotion the way the first one did. And as a matter of fact, he made it very clear that if you couldn't handle your emotions, you would be sitting right next to him. And that's exactly what happened to me. Because when things wouldn't go my way, you knew it. <laughs> I, I, didn't, I didn't hide it, and sure enough, I found myself sitting right next to him. And uh, my emotions went from wanting to you know, hurt somebody on the floor to wanting to hurt him at that point. <laughs> um, but I withheld, and through that lesson, the Lord taught me some things, and the Lord has continued to teach me some things. And now as I'm sitting back and I'm watching my son and my daughter play, I can really see the wisdom that my coach was trying to teach me. Because what my coach understood is that when the referee would see that emotion from me, uh, he wouldn't have good thoughts. As a matter of fact, it would probably put a bad taste in his mouth for me. And if something else happened, uh, he would be more likely to, to blame it on me. And, and that's just the way life is. And through this, the Lord was reminding me of something. The Lord was reminding me of uh, the discipline of holding out. The discipline of holding out for God to do something on your behalf. Because one of the things, whether it's a game or whether it's just life in general, when things don't go our way, our tendency is to want to get in there and make things happen. But the problem with that is this. If we're going to follow the Lord and trust in Him, we must also trust in His ways. The scripture makes it clear that Moses not only wanted to know God, he wanted to know his ways. God has a way of working things. And he has arranged your life in a specific way so that you would learn to trust in him and not in yourself. But if you are going to reach the point that you trust in him, you're going to have to see him move and work. And if you try to step in and make life happen in your own ways, you will not get to the point that you see God work on your behalf. 
Because when you step in with your own ways, it messes it up. And you know what? Then you have to deal with the consequences of you trying to do things your own ways. And the only way to, to correct it all is to step back and to say, God, what do you want to do here? I'm going to wait on you. And let me just tell you, waiting on the Lord can be one of the hardest disciplines that you will learn. Because God sees, thing, sees things with the mindset of eternity. And so your entire life is but a blip when you look at the span of eternity. But in our eyes, we think of each moment as being so long. I mean, especially when you're a child, you think that life will never change. But the older you get, you see how fast things change. Now, take that mindset and think about how God sees things. Because He views you with the mindset of eternity because He created you to be eternal. That's His heart for you, that you would be eternal. And if you're going to be eternal and you're going to live with Him for eternity, He's got some intense training to do in your life. You need to get this. And the thing that we need to get is that we trust in Him and we don't step in and try to make things work out when He doesn't work on our time frame. This is a huge lesson for us. And it's not one that's easy to grasp. I want to look at someone in Scripture this morning. We're going to look at Abraham and Sarah who had to learn this very lesson. And we're going to go through a lot of chapters here with this, but I'm just going to be pulling out a couple verses because it all centers around this promise that was given to Abraham and Sarah. And you have been given promises by the Lord. Some of them are in the Word, and they apply to all of us. Things like, God works for the good of those who love Him. When you think about a promise like that, you can start to develop a, an expectation of what that looks like. And when you do that, if things don't work out the way that you think they should, or in the timing you think you sh they should, you start to doubt God. You doubt His Word, you doubt His heart, you doubt His power. And so it's crucial that when we read something in here, or maybe God speaks something to us in our prayer time, maybe He speaks it through someone who knows us and loves us, whatever it is, it's crucial that we allow Him to fulfill that promise in His timing and in His way. And we're going to see that Abraham and Sarah struggled with that very thing. But here's the beauty of it. The Scripture makes it clear they struggled. We're going to see that. But in Hebrews 11, they are praised for their faith. If you follow the Lord, you're, you're going to struggle with this. But here's the beauty of it. If you continue to come back to Him and to say, Lord, I doubted you again. Forgive me. I want to trust in you. I want to trust in your ways then we are able to finish well. The very thing we talked about last week. First scripture I want to look at is Genesis 12. I'm just going to look at the first four verses. And what this does is it just sets out the promise that was given to Abraham and Sarah. Verse 1, and I'm reading out of the message, God told Abraham, leave your country, your family, and your father's home for a land I will show you. First thing I want you to capture here, he's asking Abraham to make some major sacrifices. If God is moving in your life, he's going to ask some sacrifices of you. It's the way it is. He asked Jesus to sacrifice. He's going to ask us to sacrifice. And the reason for that is, is you're going to learn to love him through your sacrifice. Love takes sacrifice. It's going to be asked of you. But here's the thing. When we sacrifice for God or we sacrifice for someone, you know what we want to see? We want to see some return. Hey, I sacrificed for you. You better come through. And we do the very thing with God. Hey, I've sacrificed for you. I didn't go out and chase this or chase that. And when you told me to do this, I did it. So why aren't you coming through for me? We can get that attitude very quickly. It goes on and here's what God says to him. I will make you a great nation and bless you. I'll make you famous. You'll be a blessing. I'll bless those who bless you. Those who curse you, I'll curse. All families of the earth will be blessed through you. 
So Abraham left just as God said, and Lot left with him. And here's what I want you to see in that last verse. Abraham was 75 years old. Now, here's the promise you need to understand in this. He says, I'll make a great nation of you. Now, if you don't know the story of Abraham and Sarah, Sarah had no children. She was barren. They're 75 years old. Now, at this time, you'll see in Genesis 6, God had said, okay, I'm going to put... Uh, people are only going to live to be about 120 years old from now on because they had been living a long time uh, previous to that. And he said 120. That's that's the cap. They're 75 years old. OK, now, although most people in our lifetime right now aren't making it to 120. I mean, 100 is really old in our culture right now. 75 is still pretty old even in that culture. Sorry, 70 and 80 year olds. It's just the way it is. I love you enough to tell you the truth. No. Okay. So they're older. They've not had children up to this point. Okay. Now, here's the other thing. In that culture, children were everything. Children were the way they gauged how much God loved you and how good you were. Because if you're a good person, God's just going to lavish a lot of kids on you. But if you don't have any kids, all the neighbors are wondering, what's wrong with them? What kind of sin is going on in their life? Well, they've been going through this this whole time. And then suddenly God shows up in their old age and says, I'm going to make a nation out of you. That means they're going to have a lot of kids. That's insane. After all they've been going through, what kind of jerk shows up at the end of your life and says, I'm going to make a nation out of you. But you know what? They choose to believe him. They choose to believe his heart is good and that even though the enemy is no doubt pointing out some of these things I just shared with you, they choose to say, I don't, I'm not going to listen to the enemy. I'm going to listen to the God that I believe loves me. And so they did it. They sacrificed. They moved and they left everything they had known because they believed that God would bless them. All right, now I'm going to jump over to chapter 15, and I just want to look at some of the first few verses there. After all these things, the word of God came to Abraham, Abram in a vision. Don't be afraid, Abram. I'm your shield. Your reward will be grand. Abram said, God, Master, what use are your gifts as long as I'm childless? And Eliezer of Damascus is going to inherit everything. Abraham continued, See, you've given me no children, and now a mere house servant is going to get it all. Then God's message came, Don't worry. He won't be your heir. A son a son from your own body will be your heir. Then he took him aside and said, look at the sky, count the stars. Can you do it? Count your descendants. You're going to have a big family, Abram. And he believed, he believed God. God declared to him, set right with God. God continued, I'm the same God who brought you from Ur of the Chaldees and gave you this land to own. Now, here's what I want you to see in this. There, there's a time span of years that we didn't read through there, okay? And there's all kinds of things happening. And in the midst of it all, Abraham, who believed when God first made the promise, and that was a big step for him. Later on down the road, he starts to doubt. Why? Because he's still childless. I mean, even if God had given him a child then, when they were 75, that would have been amazing. But now he still hasn't done it. And so Abraham says, God, this is ridiculous. You've said this, but you haven't come through, but you're still declaring this promise. Well, this is the only way that it can work out. Now, here's what I want you to understand. I want you to see partly in this. God doesn't say to him at that point, well, but Abraham, you're not understanding. This is how I'm going to do it. He doesn't do that. He just says, Believe me. And he goes out and he shows Abraham how, how big and powerful he is by having him look at the sky and showing him what he's capable of. 
Now, that's the way that God is going to work in our life, too. When we start to complain about things, it doesn't mean he's going to show up and say, now, child, I, you've been faithful and, and I appreciate it. And I just want you to know this is how it's going to happen. Many times he still doesn't do it, even when we're doubting. He just comes to us and he says, trust me. Why does he do that? Is it because he likes playing games with us? Is it because he's mean? No, it's because his understanding is so far beyond us. If we're going to follow him for eternity the way that we need to, this is the relationship we've got to have. We've got to have this, this, it's not blind faith, but it's this faith where we just don't understand. We don't get it. But we just trust him because he says it and he's shown himself that he's powerful enough. So that's exactly what he does with Abram and Abram chooses to believe again. And so they go on. Now I'm going to jump to chapter 16. First couple verses there. Sarah, Abraham's wife, hadn't yet produced a child. She had an Egyptian maid named Hagar. Sarah said to Abram, God has not seen fit to let me have a child. God has not seen fit to let me have a child. Sleep with my maid. Maybe I can get a family from her. Abraham agreed to do what Sarah said. So Sarah, Abram's wife, took her Egyptian maid Hagar and gave her to her husband Abram as a wife. Abram had been living 10 years in Canaan when this took place. 10 years. Ten years they were waiting on God's promise. They're already old. It hasn't happened. It's time to take matters into your own hands, right? That's what they did. He slept with Hagar and she got pregnant. When Hagar learned she was pregnant, she looked down on her mistress. Sarah told Abram, it's all your fault. <laughs> I'll leave that one alone. <laughs> that I'm suffering this abuse I put my, <laughs> oh boy, I really want to go into that, but I'm not, okay. <laughs> I, <laughs> I put my maid in bed with you, and the minute she knows she's pregnant, she treats me like I'm nothing. May God decide which of us is right. <sighs> Sarah and Abraham decide to take matters into their own hands. I, I mean, and I, I totally understand this because I do it. But when you think about it, it's really, it's, it's ludicrous because they're kind of halfway trusting God. I mean, if they didn't trust God at all, they would just forget the whole thing and say, we're never going to be a nation. Let's just forget it. But no, they say, yes, I trust God. We're going to be a nation. But obviously he's not powerful enough to bring it about. So we need to help him out. So the way we're going to do it is, you know, I want you to be with my maid. And as those of you who know the story, what happens from that is always worse than what was going on in the beginning. And we see this so many times in our relationships. And I'm not pointing the finger at anyone because I understand this. When you're dealing with issues of your heart and, and you see that, you know, you would be joyful if this happened. And they're saying to themselves, we'll be joyful if we just had a child. But God's not doing it, so we need to make it happen somehow. Or maybe you're a person who's saying, you know, I would be joyful if I just had a spouse. But God's not doing it, so I just, I really need to, and it, he's waited all this time, and it's so crazy. If I'm going to be happy, he must be waiting on me to do something about it. And so we step in and we do something. And what results of it on down the road is always worse than the situation that we were in before. But that's so easy for me to say, looking on the outside. When we're dealing with matters of the heart, this is hard. This is hard stuff. And it's not just relational. You can talk about with your occupation and whatever it is. Maybe God's put some dreams on your heart and it's just not happening. And so you decide, rather than waiting on Him, you're going to go after things. And what you end up doing is exactly what Sarah and Abraham did, which is you sacrifice some things that are really important in order to grasp something that really wasn't that important. And it tears everything apart. Their family undergoes turmoil. And of course, those of you 
um, who know how this all turned out, Ishmael is, is the father of the Islam nations. And, you know, you have this battle that continues on today because of it. And, and, and that's what happens from our decisions when we decide to step out. Not that God can't redeem because he has he will. He will continue to redeem. I, I don't want us to get, uh, you know, oh, no, we're, we're going to mess things up and God, God's not going to be able to fix it. He can. OK, but the point is this. The point is, is that if we will exercise faith and hold out, some really good things will happen and we won't have to deal with all the consequences of, of us stepping in with our own ways. All right. Jump down to chapter 17. Verse 1 says, when Abram was 99 years old, so we're basically 25 years later, God showed up and said to him, I am the strong God. Live entirely before me. Live to the hilt. I'll make a covenant between us and I'll give you a huge family. Overwhelmed, Abram fell flat on his face. Fifteen years later, after you're already old, I mean, come on, God, this is ridiculous. Listen, this is not a unique story in the sense that this is how God works in our life. He will say things to us and, and he will stretch it out uh, in a way that it just seems we just want to lose heart. We want to lose faith. Don't do it. Don't do it. If God has said it, he will bring it about. Now, I want to jump down in that same chapter to verses 15 and 17, God continued speaking to Abraham and Sarah, your wife, don't call her Sarah any longer. Call her Sarah. <laughs> I'll bless her. Yes, I'll give you a son by her. Oh, how I will bless her. Nations will come for her, come from her. Kings of nations will come from her. So God is just continuing to say, don't give up on me. I'm going to do this. I'm going to do this. Abraham fell flat on his face. And then he laughed, thinking, can a hundred year old father, man, father, a son? And can Sarah at 90 years have a baby? So he gets to the point where it just seems so ludicrous. He mocks God. That's essentially what he's doing. He's mocking God. And that's where the enemy can take us so easily. God says things to us. We believe it. We get to the point we're just tired of believing it. Nothing's happening. And so what do we do? Well, in our hearts, we start mocking God. It's a dangerous place to be. And thankfully, they didn't stay there. But we've got to be careful with that place. Because that's exactly where the enemy is. And that's where he wants to take us. And he can take us out with that. Now, in chapter 18, verses 11 and 12, Sarah does the same thing. Abraham and Sarah were old at this time, very old. Sarah was far past the place, the age for having babies. Sarah laughed within herself. An old woman like me get pregnant with this old man of a husband. So Sarah was in the same place. She was mocking. All right, last Last section I want to look at is chapter 21, verses 1 through 7. God visited Sarah exactly as he said he would. God did to Sarah what he promised. Sarah became pregnant and gave Abraham a son in his old age. And at the very time God had set, Abraham named him Isaac. When his son was eight years old, Abraham circumcised him just as God had commanded Abraham was a hundred years old when his son Isaac was born. So 25 years later, Sarah said, God has blessed me with laughter and all who get the news will laugh with me. She also said, whoever would have suggested to Abraham that Sarah would one day nurse a baby. Yet here I am. I'm given the old, I've given the old man a son. God came through with his promise, but it was 25 years later. And even when he first gave the promise, it seemed ridiculous. This is, again, I want to make this clear. This is how God works. I want you to think about what's going on in your life right now. What are you asking God for? Do you have enough faith that you're asking God for something? Many times we're asking God 
for things that to us seem impossible. Because compared to what we see around us, it's not the norm. Or maybe we've never seen it before. If God is putting something on your heart to pray for, you know what that means? It means He wants to do something. So pray about it. No matter how crazy it seems, keep at it. And when it doesn't happen the first month or the second or the five years later, keep at it. He's doing it because He wants to do something. Why doesn't He act more quickly? I don't know all the reasons. I just know that it has to do with training my heart to live with Him for eternity. So what is it that's important to you right now? What are you really asking God for? If you are going to have the power to hold out, just like Abraham and Sarah, because they did, they failed many times, they went down, they doubted, they mocked God, they went through all kinds of things. But in the end, they held on because they still sacrificed. They sacrificed and left their home. Their actions showed that they loved God, even though that in their heart they were doubting at times. If you've been doubting, listen, it's okay. I have yet to find someone in this Word besides Jesus Himself who didn't. It doesn't mean that you can't finish well. It doesn't mean that God doesn't still want to do something in your life. But if you are going to allow it to happen, you must hold on. Now there's three things that I want to point out that the enemy throws at us to keep us from holding on, okay? The first one is this. The first one is, if we're going to have the power to hold out, we must lay down our expectations, okay? Now in Hebrews, when, when uh, chapter 11, verse 1, it gives us a, defini a definition of faith. And it essentially tells us that faith is being certain of what we don't see. Now, some of us could say, well, that just means Jesus. Well, it certainly does, because we don't see Him, yet we've got to have faith. But here's the other thing. Again, God will speak things to you through His Word, through, through others personally, and if we are going to exercise the faith, guess what? He's not going to show us how it's going to turn out. I, I do this all the time. Uh, I'll hear God say something, whatever it is, and immediately, you know what I do? And many of you do this. We try to figure out how He's going to do it. And the thing I've learned over and over again is that if I can dream of how He's going to do it, it's wrong. That's exactly right. It is always, always wrong. He always works through a way that I cannot even fathom. I mean, it's, it's, it's over and over. And, and I know I've bored you over the years with the stories of how God works in my life. But, you know, just, just real quickly, as I was just thinking, two of the ones um, that, that came to my mind was, you know, the place that we're living in right now. That was something that I felt God spoke spoke to me, I'm going to do this six months before it ever happened. And it seemed crazy and I didn't even want to tell people. But then as it got closer and closer, God began to show me how big of an obstacle it was, you know, what it would cost, how much money I had, <laughs> what the payments would be, how much I make. And I was like, there's no way. And I, I began to falter. I'm like, no way that can happen. But he did it. He did it. Why? I don't know. He just That's something he decided to do. When we first came here, we had a mountain of debt. I thought we will never pay this off in our lifetime. And God began to speak through other people. He's going to do it. And you know what? He did it. And he did it through a way I would have never imagined. The first thing that we must do if we are going to exercise the power to hold out for the things that God promises us is if you can figure out how it's going to happen, forget that. That is not how it's going to happen. You must simply move forward trusting He's going to do it. And here's something I find. I'll be praying about something that God will move. And at the same time, I'll be experiencing some kind of other difficulty over here that seems totally unrelated. But this thing over here is frustrating me. It's distracting me. I'm trying to have faith in God for this, but this thing's just really annoying me. If I can continue to pray for this thing over here and walk it out, many times I find that somehow God moves through this thing and He answers my prayer about this thing over here. And it seemed totally unrelated. He, he, 
he, he's amazing in, in doing that. But it's part of the way that he works. And it just takes a faith to say, I, I, I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to hold on to this. Second thing, believing you are not disqualified. Okay, I want to go back to this. In Abraham and Sarah's culture, if you were barren, people thought there was something wrong with you. You know, in the Gospel of John, the disciples were, were with Jesus, and uh, there was a blind person, and they said to Jesus, Who sinned, this man or his parents, that he was born blind? That was the attitude of the culture. If there is something bad going on with you, either you sinned or your parents, something is wrong. But that was not the case. And if we choose to believe those things that don't come from God, it's just things that maybe even godly people threw out and we say, oh, that must be true. It is going to make us believe that we are disqualified. We start to look at our life and we say, why did this bad thing happen to me? Well, I bet it's because of this sin over here that I did or this one over here. Or you know what? I, I've just I've never been able to love God like so and so over there. You know what? I, I just I, God is powerful enough to answer this promise, but you know what? I just don't think I'm good enough. I, I'm not that person, whoever it is. And the enemy comes in and he says to us, "You're disqualified because of this. Don't fall for that." It's the enemy wanting you not to believe what God wants to fulfill. And if you believe it, like Sarah could have been tempted to, to believe that she was disqualified, something disqualified her from having a son, let alone a great nation and blessing all the world, we're never going to allow God to do what he wants to do. Because God invites us to be a part of it. He doesn't just do it. He invites us to be a part of it, and we must exercise faith to be a part of it. Last thing, trusting that the Lord is good. Trusting that the Lord is good. In Genesis, where Sarah laughs and Abraham laughs at God, essentially in their heart, here's what they're saying. Yeah, I've experienced God. I've seen Him move. I know He's powerful. But you know what? I, I just... I don't think that he loves me enough. Essentially, and, and we don't put words into this. They didn't put words into it. They were just laughing. And they were just basically saying, you know what? I don't believe in the goodness of God enough. I don't believe that his heart is good, that he really wants to bless me in that way. That's where we go. And we'll do it with the smallest things. If we're playing in a game and it doesn't go our way, suddenly... You know, first it starts out, you know, it's their fault, but then maybe it's my fault. Eventually, we take it to God. God just doesn't love me. God just doesn't want to bless me because, you know, he allowed it to happen for so-and-so. Why won't he allow it to happen for me? And this is where the enemy goes. So if we're going to hold out and experience the blessings of the Lord because the Lord wants to bless us, here's what's got to happen. First of all, i got to get rid of my expectations. However I'm imagining God fulfilling a promise, get rid of it. That's not how it's going to happen. Second of all, I can't fall for the lie I'm disqualified. You are not disqualified because Jesus is the one who qualifies you. It's His blood. The one thing God asks of you is that you believe. And believing means you obey. I mean, if you don't obey, you don't really believe. That's all He asks of you. And so if we will believe, we are qualified. And the third thing is this. Along the path, when He doesn't answer in the time frame we think He should, we can't fall for the lie that His heart is bad. Most of the world around us lives with that sentiment in their heart that God is not really good. And the reason they believe that is because they look at their life and they say, if God is good, why did this happen? Why did my loved one die? Why did I you know, lose this job? Why did that happen? And now I'm known as this person. On and on it goes. And we blame it on God. Whether we're blaming it on ourselves or we're blaming it on God, either one separates us from the promises of God. We're celebrating right now the birth of Jesus. And in celebrating the birth of Jesus, we're also celebrating His second coming. 
But if we, it's been a long time since his first coming. And if we're going to live with this expectation, he's coming back and this whole world is going to change and he's going to redo it all and he's going to be king, we're going to have to live with a faith that says, I don't see it happening, but I trust that he's good. I trust that I'm qualified through his blood. And however it's going to happen, because, you know, maybe you've been studying the word and things aren't going the way you think they should. Well, they're not. <laughs> I don't know how it's going to happen. I just know it's going to happen in a way that we don't understand. If we're going to be standing on that day and welcoming him and hearing him say, well done, good and faithful servant, we're going to have to exercise a power to hold out because that is faith. Jesus, you have blessed us in so many ways and yet you want to do more. When I think about each life, the people that I know sitting all around me here, Lord, I know that there are promises on their life and you want to give it to them, but you're holding out. You've got your reasons. You're building faith in them. You're waiting for other things to come together. Lord, I pray faith for each one of us to continue to hold out and trust in you and not try to intervene with ways that are our own, that we would see your goodness that we would see your glory in Jesus name amen if you would